My name is Terry Baxter. I'm the archivist for Multnomah County Archives, which is in Portland, Oregon, and the Oregon Country Fair, which is in Eugene, Oregon. Um, I've been an archivist uh, in various settings since 1985. And uh, uh, in service to S, I've done quite a few different things with um, SA and um, Northwest Archivist, particularly in uh, archival service. But in SA, I've um, chaired the diversity committee. I've been SA council on the nominations committee and am surprisingly the incoming vice president for the organization. So that's uh, uh, kind of my service in a nutshell. That is quite a bit of service and not a surprise at all that you are now going to be vice president, which congratulations. Thanks. So my first question for you is a question we frequently get as archivists. Mm -hmm. And that's what is an archivist, but also why did you become an archivist and how did you become an archivist? Well, uh, let's get back to what is an archivist. I'll start with how I became an archivist. And that's, uh, if, if you may have heard this story before because I, uh, th this is a question that does get asked a lot. So if you have, bear with me. But uh, um, I always start with saying I got in for the money which is an insider joke because nobody gets into archives for the money, but I really did because I was uh, in college at the time working on my bachelor's degree in history. And uh, I also was raising a family, carrying 18 hours in school and working 40 to 50 hours managing an Arby's. Uh, and so as you, as you can imagine, that was, uh, well, I was young. I could, it wasn't that big of a deal, but it, you know, it was a lot to do at, at one time time and um, this Oregon State Archives, not the University, the State of Oregon Archives, um, posted a student worker um, job that paid about what I made at uh, managing the Arby's, but for only 25 hours a week. And so it's kind of a no brainer. I said, yeah, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to go work in the archives and save some time. Right. And so I did. And I started out <coughs> <clears throat> started out kind of in, a, you know, kind of the awe of the artifact area of archives. So I've, uh, the very first collection I uh, was doing some kind of like preliminary refoldering type stuff, you know, once you get the students. And uh, I was uh, um, the Whitman uh, massacre trial documents, which was fascinating to me on, on the face of things, but, uh, um, you know, started to lead towards some other, you know, processing type jobs and working, working with the uh, uh, various documents. And then I got assigned to do a very, a large cataloging basically project with the territorial and provisional government records of Oregon, which again was, these are old and cool documents, you know? So, so I, I kind of thought, well, if I get my degree, I could actually do this work. It pays pretty well. And it was really still about the money. You know, it was a good paying steady job with government benefits. So when a job opened up in the uh, uh, summertime on a three-year records management um, project, I uh, applied and got the job. And so I started working on that. And then things really changed. And this kind of will segue into what, what an archivist is in a lot of ways, because I don't believe an archivist is someone who just uh, writes a bunch of stuff about a bunch of documents and you know puts that together. Uh, my boss was given the opportunity to go to a thing called Camp Pitt, which was the, oh man, it has a long name, uh, Advan the Institute for Advanced Archival Administration or something like that. And uh, it was a mid, supposedly a mid-career archivist um, bonding, uh, learning about electronic records, learning about, um, you know, management techniques in a lot of ways is a precursor to things like the Archi uh, Archives Leadership Institute and that was cohort based and designed to give skills, techniques and kind of like uh, connections to folks. And my boss said, I don't want to go to this. Would do you want to go? And I said, hmm, sounds interesting. It's in Pittsburgh. Why, why not give it a whirl and see, see what it's all about? And uh, I did. And it was really fascinating to see a bunch of folks much further along in their careers than I was um, thinking about archives in a different way, thinking about archives as means to an end, as uh, you can 
you can use archives for a lot of different stuff and you could use them you know for regular stuff regular research and you can use them for entertainment but you can use them to make change and i think that was really something i hadn't thought about at all up to that point and once i started to think about things in that way and conceptualize archives and archivists as change makers and as you know people that could do active work you know not just sitting in an office processing records or you know, working with ivory, ivory tower researchers, but that everyday regular problems could be solved. People with just stuff they need to get done, you can help them get that stuff done. And that really turned a switch in my head. And I saw what an archivist is, is a facilitator, a connector, someone who is out there actively trying to make their community, broader communities, individuals' lives better. And so so once I saw that through that class, then I was hooked and it became something I just wanted to do the rest of my life. I love that answer. That's, I didn't, I don't think I've heard the story about the, it really was the money. First of all, that was <laughs> a very amusing. Um, but I love the, the archivists being facilitators, connectors, helping to reveal some of those truths. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, next question for you is what is your favorite item in the archives or the most curious or mysterious item in the archives that you've found? Hmm. Yeah, those are those are always the they're interesting questions because you know it's like which of your children are the favorite? The one that's in front of you right now, right? <laughs> so um, but I would say I, I, one of my absolute favorite. To, my, to myself personally, and it's not it's not particularly important, but it, it's to me it's really kind of fun, and it it's kind of one of those what could be kind of stories. So, uh, in in Oregon in 1964, actually in '63 they started planning for it. Um, the uh, a commission was set up, and it was we have we have a set of records. I believe the city of Portland has a set of records. So I think both institutions were, um, you know, kind of, it was one of those multi-jurisdictional organizations, but it was the Delta Recreation Commission. And it was set up to investigate and propose a bond measure to set up a dual use um, Major League Baseball and NFL Stadium in Delta Park. And um, being an NFL guy, like I, I really am into the NFL of all sports, I think that's the one I kind of follow the most. Um, it was really fascinating to me to see how close this came. Not really close. It was close enough to get on a bond measure, but it was voted down pretty handily, I think by about 15%. But it was a commission that was just set up to, they, they went through in the miniature there and the pictures, it was kind of this weird dome, dome almost spacecrafty looking thing. And it was really, we have the postcards that they sent out to show what it would be like. And it was modeled after some of the really innovative dual use stadiums at the time. So it was set up to have like, uh, retract, I believe it had a retractable roof and was going to be, you know, set up in a way that you could do both of these things and attract two major league teams here. And baseball's had a pretty long history in Portland with AAA teams like the Portland Beavers, but football has really never been a thing here. So those, you know, the records were just cool to me. You know, they have all the stuff in the election stuff, the way it was voted down, so sad. And then um, they just kind of sat there most of the time I've been. I've been at the county archives for 24 years, 23 years now. And they've only been used a couple times it, with the exception of just the actual picture used for an exhibit. Um, but the guy that did the research was researching sports in, or in Portland, specifically Portland, not in Oregon. And uh, his conclusion was that the failure of the Delta Dome was both good and also it was Portlandy, in the sense that, I don't know if you've been to Delta Park, but Delta Park now has soccer stadiums. It's got baseball fields, softball fields, tracks, and all this stuff. And he said, the fact that we don't have an observational sport set up in Delta Park, but we have a participatory sport set up in Delta Park is really a lot more Portlandy, and it's also probably better for the community. And I hadn't thought about it that way, but that's absolutely true because I do like to play sports too. So I can see where that makes a lot more sense to have something where people are, you know, getting off their asses and out, like actually running out there and playing as opposed to, you know, just watching sports either in the stadium or on TV. So yeah, so it kind of kind of worked out. So that's that's a collection that's kind of near and dear to my heart. 
I had not heard that before, but the uh, your description that's so Portlandy does seem <laughs> accurate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Terry, one last question for you, and that's what's the best or most creative public use of the collections you've seen? Well, I will. I, there, there's there's several answers to this, but I'm going to give you the one that I think is the most important. And uh, we got in a collection, maybe. I'm going to say probably 10 years ago. That's a, I could give you an a exact answer if I looked it up. I think it's about 10 years ago. And it was a collection called the Regional Drug Initiative. And this was a really multi-jurisdictional group with the, the, it, the reason we have the records is because the district attorney led the, led the group. But it was the Sheriff's Office, City of Portland Police Bureau, FBI, anybody that might have kind of an intersection with the nascent war on drugs because that's really what this was this was the governmental layout for how to how to proceed with the war on drugs and so again a collection that just sat there for a long time but getting to your ideas about um how how um research and um you know outreach and reference might be a little different nowadays i knew a guy who was interested in this stuff because he'd done work with, um, he'd done work on a couple of sign projects in town, and I knew he had some interest in this in this uh, area. So I said, "Hey, come on out, come out, and check this new collection out, and see what it is." It wasn't processed yet, but I knew generally what was in it, and I knew you know what he was interested in. He started plowing through it, and he found some stuff for his project, and then he left uh, without, you know, it wasn't a really big deal until he came back about a year later, and he said, "I am doing research on drug houses." And I said, well, I don't know anything about drug houses. <laughs> you know? He said, well, that's what, the, that's what they're called. And it, evidently a family member had had a house that had been called a drug house. And that was his vernacular for a drug house. And, you know, so I was, I was still trying to make the connection here, what was going on. And uh, finally, I got down to the point that his, his relative's house had been seized as a drug house. And I said, are you talking about civil forfeiture? He says, I don't know, let's look it up. And so we started looking up some of the laws. He says, that's totally it. And so all of a sudden, this collection that had been used kind of for this little purpose ballooned. And uh, he started doing quite a bit of research in the use of civil forfeiture in the war on drugs in Portland to dismantle urban neighborhoods so they could so that they could then be revitalized or you know, whatever term you want to use for that. Some people might have other other terms for it, but but that was the term used. Um, but but he then proceeded to do quite a bit of research in that to kind of show whole neighborhoods, not just his, his relatives' house, but whole neighborhoods' interest in what was going on with gentrification and some of the other some of the other issues that Portland faces on a regular basis, and how that can be traced back to Multnomah County's active and direct participation in the fake war on drugs, which is really a war on black folks. You know, I mean, black and brown folks. And, uh, you know, um, it's just fascinating to me how two things in this really fascinating. Me. One is that the records are just sitting there. I mean, you know, this is like a blueprint for what, what everybody has said was so horrible and happened. This is a blueprint for it. I mean, it, nobody was hiding anything. This was just right there. But the other thing is how just a really small descriptive element makes the difference between whether people can find this stuff or not. If I had just said, well, drug house, don't know what it means, keep on moving, <laughs> then this collection would have just sat there. But by kind of teasing out what was really, what a drug house really was, what 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 could it mean in government tease, really made it, uh, made, the, made the connection successful so that the research worked and worked for somebody who may not be familiar, number one, with archives terminology, but also government terminology. So. So that is a that was a really fascinating and good public use of some of our records. Yeah, th that is one of the best examples I think I've heard. That is such a great story. Thank you for mm -hmm. sharing that. And I love that it came full circle to archivists being connectors, which is yeah. what you started with. Wonderful. Well, Terry, those were all of my official questions. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us before you go? Uh, I don't know. I, I like meeting archivists. So if uh, if you see me walking around or something, I'm always happy to buy someone a beer or hang out, chat, whatever. <laughs>